scripture in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just give you 30 seconds until the baskets are finished going round there, and then we'll do this, uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2. And by the way, the um, uh, Christmas dinner and I, uh, uh, without me getting in, I, every time I go to announce these things, I get it mixed up. I'll have you turn it up at the wrong location on the wrong day with the wrong price. So better you just read it over on that uh, notice board over there, and then we're going to try to put the announcements up on that there for a little while afterwards. But nevertheless, go to the notice board, find out what you need to know about the Christmas dinner. There's already a lot of names been put in. There has to be a deposit given, but it'll tell you all the details you know is down there. All right, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2. Uh, and when he, when he had fasted, this is the Lord Jesus, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, I read that not so long ago, and I said, dear God, I hope you're not talking to me. <laughs> Look at somebody say, it may be a word for you. It may be a word for you. Oh, please, God, don't let it be a word for me. When he had fasted 40 minutes, ah, I can receive that fasted 40 days and 40 nights. You know, I was mentored by a man who, who fasted on a consistent basis. That man fasted. A 21 day fast was his regular. Uh, his 21 day fast on a regular basis. Uh, he would minister. And when he would minister, he'd minister in the power of God. Periodically, he would do a 40 day one. Uh, uh, a 40 day fast. And I tell you, uh, it was something else to watch. But when he was finished with it, people were afraid to go near him. <laughs> people were afraid to go near him. The power of God operated. People come to say, and say to me, is it, is it okay to go into the meeting tonight? Because they got afraid. He, he, God would show them things about their lives. Anyway, it was amazing. But anyway, when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterwards hungered. And when the tempter, oh, the tempter, the bad article, the hooligan himself. When the tempter came to him, he said, if you be the son of God, then command these stones to be made into bread. But he answered and said, it is written, devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, then cast yourself down, for it is written. He gives his angels charge over concerning you, uh, 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 and in their hands you shall, he shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto them, It's written, devil, that thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Isn't it striking? that in, in both what we call the temptations of the Lord, it was two times the enemy came in to trap, he two times he came in to, to buffet Jesus, two times, and he came in both times with the same statement, if you be the Son of God. Uh, uh, somehow I, I think the devil is a bit offline because there's no way Jesus is going to go, oh, I wonder, am I the Son of God? Twice he said it, if you are the Son of God, because you will find in your lifetime that when the enemy comes to attack you, normally when you're younger, he attacks you this way. If you're, if you're a Christian that's not reading your word, if you're a Christian that is not pursuing God, then he'll still use the same tactic on you. He'll say, if you are a real believer, if God is really on your side, if that is really God talking to you, he always tries to hit you on the same thing. In the Garden of Eden, that he said to Eve, did God say? He's always trying to wind it round to see if you really know what God has really said. And you have got to read your word until it has got deep down on the inside. The first thing he comes for is your identity so that you're not sure if you belong to God at all. I've talked to believers after 30 years of walking with them, turn around and say, I'm not even sure if I'm saved or not. I'm not even sure if I'm forgiven. I've talked to people all ranks and sizes and years who has an identity problem. They do not know who they are in Christ Jesus. They don't know. And the thing is, the basics is that you and I have to learn. We have to get it inside our thinking. So there's no question about it that, that we belong to God. Look at somebody say, I belong to God. The more we know that and the more we understand it, the less opportunity the enemy will have against you. He'll try to, he'll taunt you. Are you really forgiven? 
Did God, did God, I don't think that was the devil. I think that was God did that to you. You have got to come to an understanding which camp things is coming from, what God really said, and stick with it above all things. And so tonight we're going to clamp some of these things down for you. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 it says, Paul wrote this, I am crucified with Christ. Look at somebody say, so am I, so am I. I am, I don't, don't worry about the screens. It looks like we got a, a, a glimpse there, but don't worry about them tonight. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. You have got to learn how to identify first off with, with the Lord Jesus. I want to say some things to you now that will make a good CD to put in your car as you're driving along and you just roll it over again until it gets deep down into your thinking. But you've got to begin to say some things to yourself that I am crucified with Christ Jesus. I was bought with a price. Look at somebody say, I was bought with a price. I was, I was, the blood of Jesus Christ bought me. I am blood bought. I am blood washed. I am forgiven. I am accepted. I am loved. I am highly favored. Now, when I'm using the terminology, I am talking about us, that you can put your name in there and call it the same. But let me tell you, here's what we are. We are loved and we are highly favored by God himself. We are the righteousness. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are justified. That's just as if I've never sinned. We are sanctified unto God, uh, set apart unto God, and set apart by God. We are called and we are chosen. You'd be surprised the people out there that doesn't know those fundamental basics. But you need to get those into your thinking that you can rehearse them at a second of time. I had an occasion last night at the end of a meeting when a man said to me, tell me how this all started for you. It's a long time since anybody asked me that. They said, how did this all start? And I, I was wondering what exactly was he talking about, ministry, or did I go to Bible school? And as I began to start off saying, I realized this man didn't know anything about salvation. And I had an occasion to recite to him things that's deep on the inside of me, not going back through my testimony, but tell him the word. I was able to tell him the word in a few minutes so there would be no question about it, that exactly who he was talking about, that I am. I'm a child of God. Look at somebody saying, so am I. You got to remember that there is more for us than there is against us. That he always, always, always causes us to triumph. That when we fall, we shall arise. That I am the redeemed of the Lord. I am an overcomer. I am a devil chaser, an extraordinary individual. I'm a child of the living God. Now, if you could just take that and rehearse that and tell yourself that in the mornings when you get out of bed, you'll feel strong. Before you even start the day, you'll get strong. So I want to say things to you. I'll hardly get to get to recite them, but I'm going to say them to you. They're going to be in a tape and you can listen. Many, many years ago, I'll come to this understanding that if I could change my thinking, I could change my world. I could change my surroundings. Instead of me waiting on something out there happening to me, I could something happen in here that would affect the outside here. And I said to the Lord, I said, you're going to have to teach me how to change my thinking. Teach me, how do I change my thinking? How do I start? And I remember sitting at a desk and the thoughts started to pour down and I began to write them down. At one point I said, could you slow up a bit? Could you slow up a bit? And I started to write them down and then as I re went through them, I was able to add a bit more here and, here and there. But I want to give them to you. I give them to you right now for about the next 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to use the word I and please don't think Joe Corey's egotistical and he's talking about him. I have to use the word I, which is encompasses us all, okay? So when I shout I, it simply means you. You can put your name in there as good over it. Here's what he said, first of all, to tell me. I had to rehearse this. I had to say this till it got inside me, that I am God's greatest miracle. I am God's greatest miracles. It says in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So let's get on with it. I am made in the image of Almighty God. Since the beginning of time, neither has there been another with my mind, my heart, my eyes, my ears, my hands, my hair, or my mouth. 
none that came before, none that live today, and none that will come tomorrow can walk, talk, move, and think exactly like me. All men are my brothers, yet I am different from all the rest. I am unique, I am rare, I am valuable. I am one in seven billion people. I am designer made, and when I die, I cannot be replaced. Look at somebody just smile, just smile. Now, this is not Joe talking, okay? This is what you are supposed to be saying to you. I get a hold of Raymond, he'll probably make this into a song, and then he'll sing it to us. I have unlimited potential because God said, all things are possible unto us. I'm not on this earth by chance, but I am here for a purpose. In fact, I was born for such a time as this. I was made to walk and to talk and to communicate with the creator of the universe. I was bought with a price. I am his child. God knows no defeat. He always emerges victorious. And so shall I. Look at somebody say, so shall I. Free is number two. I will employ love because love never fails. Now this is the greatest secret to all success and all ventures. Without it, without it, uh, you will fail. Even if you have all knowledge, it will fail if you do not have love. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, the King James has used the words charity, which simply means love. Love suffereth long. Uh, it's kind. Uh, uh, love envious not. Love uh, fauntless not itself. It's not puffed up. Uh, it does not behave itself unseemly. Uh, uh, it seeketh not her own. It is not easily provoked. It thinketh no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It, it, it believes in all things. It hopes in all things. It endures all things. In fact, it says that love never fails. Therefore, I will seek ways to love. I will find ways to love. And I will endeavor to use love as often and everywhere I can. Number three, I will persist until I succeed. I shall never consider defeat. I will remove from my vocabulary words and phrases such as quit, cannot, unable, impossible, out of the question, failure, unworkable, hopeless, and retreat. I will remove them from my vocabulary. I will persist in this knowledge that each failure will increase my chances for success at the next attempt. I wrote this. It is always, always too soon to give up. I finished it with this. I will not quit until I win. There's a good one to say. Look at somebody say, I will not quit until I win. Phase four. I will forget the happenings of the day that is gone whether it was good or whether it was bad. And I will greet the new son with this confidence that this day will be the best day of my life. Know that one of the greatest principles, the greatest principles of success is this. If I persist long enough, I will win. These four words have carried me through every adversity and helped me maintain my life in a balance. And here they are, this Two shall pass. Everybody shout, this too shall pass. Number five. I will learn to laugh at the storm. No, no, no living creature can laugh except the human beings. Trees bleed when they're cut. Beasts of the field cry in pain and hunger. But only mankind, only human beings have the gift of laughter. So I will use mine whenever I choose to or wherever I can. In fact, I will cultivate a habit of laughter. Number six. Today I will multiply my value by a hundredfold. Grains of wheat, they face three futures. Either they can be fed in a feeder and put through and fed to the cattle, 
or they can be taken and ground into flour to make bread, or they can be placed in the ground. They can be placed in the ground and allowed to grow to divide and produce a thousand, a thousand grains. The wheat cannot choose whether it shall be, but we can, but we can. Which brings us to number seven. So I will act now. I wrote it this way in them years ago when I wrote it. I don't know why I wrote it this way, but I did. Master procrastination and seize the moment. I must have been having an intellectual thought that day. But I wrote it, master procrastination and seize the moment. After that, I changed it to just simply, just do it. Look at somebody say, just do it. I know master procrastination and seize the moment sounds better, but for the rest of us, just do it. The Bible says in Mark 4, 31, it says, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which is sown in the ground. Uh, it's the least of all the seeds that's in the earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, and it shoots out with great branches, so as even the birds of the earth may lodge there and find shadow underneath it. So I wrote this. What I have has potential for greatness if I sow it. Did you get that one? What I have has great potential if it's potential for greatness if I sow it. Dreams are worthless, of no value, unless they're followed by action. Number eight. I will forgive those who trespassed against me. I will hold no bitterness, no resentment, for life is too short. I will forgive myself. I will put the past to the past and I will go on. I will waste not a moment mourning over yesterday's defeats nor yesterday's aches of heart for yesterday is buried forever so I will think of it no more. Neither will I worry of tomorrow. Why should I torment myself with problems that may never come to pass. I only have one life. If I wasted today, I destroy the last, place, the last page of my life, so I will do something today to make it, mem memorial, make it memorable. Number nine. We're almost through these now. I will live today as if this was my last day. I'll say it again. I will live this day like this was my last day. If it was my last day, who would I call? If this was our last days on earth, who would I call? What would I say? To whom would I make reference? Would I write a letter? And who would I write the letter to? And in the letter, what would I say if this was my last day? What would I say to that person? What gift would I buy to that person? What wisdom would I impart to another? With that knowledge, I wrote this, that I will live this day as if it is my last day. So I won't wait. I'll write the letter now. I'll make the phone call now. I'll buy the gift now. I'll impart the wisdom while I still have breath in my body, for this day must be my best day. And number 10, I will give God all the glory. I wrote it this way. I will start each day with my mind on the Lord. I'll say it again. I will start each day with my mind on the Lord. How do you do that? How do you wake up thinking about the Lord? How do you do that? It's real easy. It's like this. The last thought you have before you sleep, sleep just puts everything on pause. And when you wake up, the last thoughts becomes your first thoughts. And if you make your last thoughts of the Lord by saying good night to him, think on these things. I guarantee you, you will wake up thinking about him first thing in the morning. So I wrote it. I will start each day with the Lord on my mind. I will give him thanks for the new day. I will tell someone each day of God's goodness. I'll find somebody somewhere to share God's goodness. And I will end my day in gratitude and thanksgiving. In fact, I wrote it. I will adopt an attitude 
of thanksgiving for simply being alive. I wrote them years ago. I wrote them out. For months, I just, I just went through it. Then I began to say to put them into sections. And I realized there was some days I was dealing with success. Some days I was dealing with, with other things. And I began to take different sections. And I would read them. I would read them. And it, it cultivated my mind. It changed my whole way of thinking. People, and people ask me, how, how, do you, how do you think that? How do you always think it's so positive? How do you take something positive out of the Scriptures? Because years ago, I changed my thinking. The Bible says when we get born again, our, our mind doesn't get born again. It's neutral. And you've got to change your mind. You've got to change your thinking by the Word of God. So I wrote this out for me that I'm passing on to you. But if you were to take them tonight, if, if you ask me real nice, I could even give them to you and we're writing some of my notes here. But if you take them and just listen to them over again and over again and apply them to your situation, to your world, you can change your thinking. And if you can change your thinking, you can change your world. Those who are meant, I got them of the Spirit of God, and those who are meant to get me to believe and to think. It was meant to get me to, to begin, first of all, to, to build me that I could become what God wanted me to be, that I could realize I'm a child of God. But it takes you further into believing you're here to help somebody else. It helps you get over the people who doesn't like you, the nasty man from table number six. It helps you get over the people who doesn't want to know you. You can forgive and walk away. It helps you get over the failures of yesterday. Everybody has them. It helps you, it helps you shut it down and say, well, that's yesterday, and I can't go back, and I can't unscramble the eggs. And If I could, if I, could I would have done it different, but I can't, so I'm putting it out of my thinking, and I'm going on. And if I had to learn all those years and years ago till it became a pattern of thinking, till it became a pattern of life, whereby I could grow from that and not have to look back. And so when the enemy came in and said, are you really a child of God? Is God really talking to you? Is that really what God, did God really say? On the basis of what I had started to learn, my whole attitude towards things had changed. My attitude towards people has changed. All I needed was a pattern and the Spirit of God give it to me. Simple, nine, nine blocks of thinking. But if you'll take them, and the Bible says if you think on those things, it will begin to generate something new, something vibrant, something wonderful on the inside of you. You begin to add from all types of different dimensions there afterwards, but you put the basics in. The devil has not changed his tactics He's not got something different for the 21st century. He does the same as he did when I was a kid. He does the same in the previous generation. He treats everybody the same like we're nobodies. But you've got to remind them that you're not a nobody. You are a child of the living God. And he cannot, cannot cross this line without getting trouble himself. In fact, when you begin to think these things, talk this way, the enemy that used to affect you won't affect you anymore. You'll shake it off like, who said that? that? You'll just shake it off. You'll press on. And those things that are trying to nail you to the past can't nail you to the past anymore because you'll realize you have a glorious and a tremendous future. And, and, and if this didn't work down here, we can't help it. We learn our lessons. But there's a multitude of people out there who's waiting on us arriving. Somebody else needs to hear what you have to say. Somebody, so, there, there's somebody somewhere has not even met you yet, but the minute you walk in, they'll smile and think, you're the person I've waited on. You, you'll say something to somebody that they've never heard before. To you, it's an everyday saying, but they've never heard it in their life before. You'll quote a scripture that you've quoted all the time, but they have never heard it before, and it'll be a light to their candle. It'll be a light in their darkness. You'll say things, and you're just your attitude about it that says, it's going to work. They'll turn around and say, are you sure? And you'll say, yes, I'm sure. But unless you have the first patterns of thinkings in, that you'll be a shaky, and you'll not be sure either. So you've got to stabilize your thinking. You've got to have a flat platform to work on. You've got to, your brain works in patterns. And so you've got to fill the pattern in and then build it from there and you'll never look back. It doesn't mean we'll not have trouble. We will. As long as we're on the face of planet Earth, there's a devil out there who will hound, he will ambush, he will try this and he will try that. But you've got to remind him who you are and tell him this, you'll be sorry. You will be sorry you crossed into my turf. 
you did this to me, I'm going to go out and I'm going to win three souls back to Jesus just because you harassed me last week. Make a phone call and tell somebody God loves them. Say, devil, every time you do this to me, I'm going to phone 10 people and tell them Jesus really loves them. Sicken them. That's what you got to do. Get back on them. Turn the tables back on them. He's trying to silence you with whatever you're going through. Refuse to be silent. Refuse to be silent. Say, devil, you did that to me today. I'm going to walk them straight. I'm going to go up to that shopping center and I'm going to find somebody that I can tell that Jesus Christ is. I'm going to tell, I'm going to pray with somebody today. And actually, when you start to push in instead of lying back, he begins to back off. He'll be sorry he tampered with you in the first place. You're a child of the living God. You're an extraordinary one, loved of the Father, watched over. God is not embarrassed about you. God is not ashamed of you. Even if you've got it wrong, he's not ashamed of you. He'll, he'll look and say, my goodness me, that's another bunch of trouble you got yourself into there, but come on up with me. His, his mercy is flowing towards you on a consistent basis. You're covered in the blood of Jesus. There's no sin that you've ever committed that God cannot cleanse and wash away in a moment of time to put you back in that place where you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Just as if you've never sinned, just as if there's nothing ever happened, sitting right in the presence of God, well able. And he has an assignment list. He said, I thought you'd never get here. We got to go here now, Joe. We got, we got to get this done. We got to get that. But you've got to have clear thinking. You've got to have a pattern to think about. So I talked it to you. So you can get it on a CD or you can get the notes and you can begin to apply them. If you put your name, when I use the word I, you put your name in there and start telling yourself that every day for at least for one week. Try it for a month, do you see? Or get Raymond to sing it to you. <laughs> before you know it, before you know it, there's a happy side begins to arrive. Before you know it, the past is past. Before you know it, you start stepping out and stepping up. And before you know it, you want to tell somebody else about the great God. You want to tell them that God can do something. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. Jesus gave his life for you. Every ounce of his blood so that he could hold you. So that he could bring himself to you. So, th so that he could say, let's go over here and help them. I've, all, I've told people this for the last years, that God knows where the hurting are. He knows the cry of the hurting. He knows who's in the sorrow. We don't know where they are, but he knows. Before, before midnight, there's somebody in Craig Avon will try to kill themselves. They'll maybe even succeed. Somebody's sitting now at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, and they're planning a way to, to, to finish their life. They've looked at the cupboard and they've set the paracetamol to one side or they've, they've walked around the lakes yesterday and they're thinking now about going to, life is so hard and it's so desperate and they're, they're doing it. And, and they're, they're always cry as, is, is, is there somebody can help? But they can never find anybody because we don't know where they are, but God does. And if your prayer is God, I'm available 24 seven. If you want me to be, just, just tell me. He puts ideas on the inside of you and you go, for, you go to the chip shop at 11 o'clock at night not needing chips, but you suddenly find there's somebody coming out of there that needs Jesus. Suddenly life becomes an adventure. It becomes an adventure. Somebody needs you. God knows where they are. He said the harvest is ripe. He said, I got a problem finding laborers. He should have no problem in here finding laborers. You're a highly equipped individual. You've just not had the opportunities to do it. Will you say, I did it and it didn't work? Well, go and find somebody else and do it again. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it until you get there. Put your failures to the past. Learn from the examples and move on. Nobody gets it right on the first time around. Everybody hits a brick wall every now and then. Everybody takes a wrong path. The good thing about this, you can say, I'm so, so sorry. Backtrack and start over again and don't do the same things twice. Learn a lesson. Learn a lesson. But there's hurting people all over there. Hurting people all over there. And they're desperate. And you don't have to be a university student to, to cope with it. You don't even have to be a Bible school grad, grad in, in order to accomplish this. You just need to have a willing heart, willing to go, willing to be there at that simple time. And you would be how simple it is to win somebody back from, from the kingdom of darkness. God made no mistake when he chose you. You're not a failure. You may have failed, but you're not a failure. You may have got it wrong, but you're not entirely wrong. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you. We're all learning. No, we, nobody knows it all. I wish I knew it all, but I don't. I'll maybe know a bit more when I get to heaven. There's no use to me then. <laughs> but let me tell you something. As long as we're here, we take what we know. 
We advance as much as we know, but we employ what we know. Most of you know more than you can ever imagine. If I've said it before, if I was to take you to some lands that I have been in, they, they, they would think you were, they were the apostle of the age. They'd sit and take notes every time you talk. But we just sit local and we think, well, who's she and who are they? But you're God. God, God called you. He chose you for such a time as this. I want to believe that this week, especially coming up into Christmas, will, will be a great opportunity for you to do works in the kingdom. There's people struggling, especially when the cold weather comes through, then the real illnesses come out, and you'll get an opportunity to hold a hand, to pray with a child. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if it does? Well, what, does? what harm have you done even if it didn't? Why don't you do it? Why don't you launch out and begin to say, let me help you. If you say, I'm a bit afraid, well, don't start on the big stuff. Start simple. Just start on the simple thing and reach out and touch. Somebody out there will love you for who you are. Somebody out there wants to hear you. They want your text message. Nobody ever texts them. They, they don't want your nastiness or the ugly side of you. They want you to smile. They want you to encourage them. They want to say things. But if you make your decision and say, God, this is going to be the best day. The best days is always the days that you help somebody else other than yourself. When you made a phone call or you reach somebody or you help somebody, that's the best days. The best days of my life is when I've communicated something to somebody and helped them through. It's the best days. So when you're waking up in the morning and say, this is the best day. This is going to be a great day for me. Who and where do you want me to be that I can do it? You do, nowadays, it's great with the phones. You don't have to even get out of your seat and do it. A phone call, a text message, an email. Somebody's waiting to hear from you. Ask the Lord to open a door and you be all them things that he wants you to be. Let's stand to our feet tonight. I know this is short. I'm tired. <laughs> I've been running around like a headless chicken. I think I'm 16 again when I'm not. So I want you to hold somebody's hand tonight. I want you to hold a hand. Father, we think the person's hand we're holding is the most tremendous person we've met in a long time. We admire them. We respect them. We thank you, Father, for that hand we're holding and the person to, to your hands down from us. There's nobody like them. Father, we're so excited. We're glad that they came here so that we could be a part of us and pray with them. We know there's other ones couldn't come here tonight because of illness, but we'll remember them during the week. God, we want you to know we signed up for this. We give our life to you, Lord Jesus, but we signed up to be used. We signed up to be deployed. We signed up for the mission. We didn't sign up to be a pew warmer. We didn't sign up just to sit on Sunday in a pew. We signed up for the mission. We signed up for the adventure. God, we want you to know if, there, if there's somebody out there that needs a message, a hug, a touch, finances or whatever, we make ourselves available tonight. Please don't ask the people over in Dromore until you've asked us. Ask us first. Ask us first. I want to pray that these folks that stand in this company tonight will be employed by the kingdom of God. They'll be ministry people. They'll be doing things and have stories and testimonies to tell. And of course, they'll have failures, but they will see the ginormous. They'll, they'll see things that other people doesn't see. They'll do it, and I'm going to believe for an anointing upon their life tonight to settle the issue and to get it through and to get it done. We, are, we, reserve, we reserve all, all rights to you. Lord, you just push the button and tell us to go, and we're ready to do it in Jesus' name. Hey, man, absolutely. All right, I'll see you. Uh, midweek is, is um, prayer meeting uh, Wednesday night, and after that's next Sunday morning. I'll